Good evening. Welcome to tonight's topic. I noticed as I um, cruised through the timetable, I said to, to Thomas, I said, we're doing gut health Friday night and there's one on Thursday night. Let's do hormones. Because I find so many people um, have hormonal imbalances and so many people don't understand the role that hormones play. So I was very excited that we could pop that into tomorrow night. And whether you're a male or a female, this lecture is applicable. And whether you're 90 or 39 or 29 or 9, this is uh, applicable, very applicable. Much misery can be prevented and even remedied by the simple balance of the hormones. But tonight we're going to be looking at diabetes. Diabetes is a lifestyle disease. Even the newspapers, even medicine will acknowledge it is a lifestyle disease. So that means it's caused by lifestyle. Many people don't realise actually what is causing it. And if you don't know what causes it, you, you won't know the remedy. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to show you what causes it and then I'm going to show you how you can turn this around. Now never in the history of mankind have human beings eaten so many carbohydrates. So we're going to do a carbohydrate assessment here. Carbohydrates are an important part of the food group but the problem is today carbohydrates are being overused and refined. So let's do an assessment of what many people have for breakfast. Um, we know what many people have for breakfast because you just go into the supermarket aisle and there's a whole aisle of it. What is it? It is cereal. I've got a, a book in my library at home called Cereal Killer. <laughs> and on the front page there's a big picture of Fruit Loops. <laughs> And you'll understand by the end of this lecture why the book's called Cereal Killer. A lot of people have bread, toast, yeah? And there's a whole aisle devoted to bread. And many people find that by mid-morning they're hungry. So then they go to the cakes or the biscuits or the donuts. So we'll just say cakes, etc. And Aussies love their pies. Do New Zealanders love their pies? Yes. And the uh, Europeans have introduced us to pizza and pasta. I didn't know what pasta was till I was 18, but I don't think there's a home today without pasta. And if children are allowed to, they'll live on it. Is that right? And Asians have introduced us to rice. My husband's an Irishman. What must every main meal contain? Potatoes. And last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallized acid that's been extracted from the sugarcane plant. Would you agree with me that New Zealanders are high carbohydrate consumers? Now everything that we eat goes into our gastrointestinal tract and it is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances absorbed into the blood then it becomes part of you or me and the tiny substance that all these foods break down to is glucose. Glucose is the main fuel used by every cell in the body. So all of this breaks down in the gut and on Friday night I'll show you that fascinating process that does that. And then the glucose gets absorbed into the blood and then it goes on the M1 main highway straight to the project manager which is your liver. And then your li liver determines where the glucose goes. The first place it will be sent is to the CBD, the inside workings of the cell. So let's have a look at what happens when the glucose comes into the cell. The glucose comes into the cell under the action of a hormone called insulin. So we're going to draw our pancreas here. Here's pancreas. Pancreas lives under your left rib. Liver lives under your right rib. And the pancreas releases two hormones 
in the blood. One is insulin, and insulin is designed to get the glucose out of the blood and into the cell. The other hormone that is released by the pancreas is glucagon. And that is the hormone that releases fat stores to get the blood sugar level up. So you can see these two hormones are balancing blood glucose levels. You'll see as we go through this. And so the glucose comes to the cell and it goes into the cell under the action of insulin. Insulin's the key that unlocks the door to get the glucose into the cell. In fact, insulin increases 30-fold the ability of the glucose to get into the cell. Now, when the glucose gets into the cell, it goes through a 20-step pathway. And this 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into what's called the powerhouse. Called the powerhouse because this eight-step pathway will give us a whopping 36 units of energy. Now, to help you understand that, let me show the pathways. So let's look at the 20-step pathway. The glucose goes in. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20 chemical reactions. This, these pathways don't use oxygen. So no oxygen in this pathway. And there are two units of energy given off with all these little chemical reactions. The end result is pyruvate. Pyruvate gets fed into the eight-step pathway. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because of the presence of oxygen, every single chemical reaction is giving off energy, 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 sometimes three, sometimes four. Wow, what a difference oxygen makes. That's why the old saying, you will receive more energy than you expend on your morning walk. Because when you exercise, you're receiving a lot of oxygen. Right now, as you're sitting here, you're breathing in about 500 mil, breathing out 500 mil. When you exercise, as Joshua and Jeremy and I did this morning, running up the hills, trying to keep up with the dog, <laughs> we'd get to the top of the hill and I'd be breathing like this. I'm breathing in 3,600 mils at that point. And I'm breathing out 3,600 mils at that point. Wow, what a difference oxygen makes. It's the most powerful way to oxygenate your body, oxygenate every single cell in the body. And you can see what a difference oxygen does. The 20-step pathway is called the glycolytic pathway. The eight-step pathway is in the mitochondria and it's called the Krebs cycle. I'll go back to speaking English now. Understanding this is pivotal in understanding diabetes, understanding how our body uses these, the glucose and how insulin works. So when we eat this food, it breaks down to glucose and under the action of insulin, it goes into the cell, going through the energy pathways to give us energy. So first place the glucose is sent is to the cell. Now on a high carbohydrate diet, we have still got glucose left over. And so now the liver causes it to be stored in the cell, particularly the muscle cell, like a little bunch of grapes. They're little molecules of glucose, just waiting there, ready to be plucked. And they're called glycogen. Glycogen is a name given to quick release glucose stores. And as we go through this illustration, you will see that that is very, very important for the diabetic. So this morning when I got up, I had a big glass of water. I was very hungry, but there was something more important for me than, than food at this moment. Have you ever done that to your stomach? Settle down, it's coming. So I had water. I had another glass of water and then I exercised. H how did I exercise? Yesterday I had breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen and tea like a pauper. I woke up and I'd had no food. Where am I going to have the energy to run up those hills? It's your glycogen stores already in your muscle just waiting to be plucked. 
And as soon as you put some demands on the body, the body's going, whoa, we need fuel. Whoa, they're not eating. Nothing's coming from the gut. Quick, go to the glycogen stores. And the glycogen stores are plucked, little molecules of glucose in the muscle cell, plucked and put through the pathway, plucked and put through the pathway. That's where you get the energy to exercise in the morning before breakfast. It's the best time to exercise. You can't exercise after you've eaten because all your energies are there. And if you do intense exercise, then your muscles are pulling energy from there and the stomach protests and cramps can happen, and etc. That's why you shouldn't dive into a cold stream after a meal. That's why you can get a cramp because the stomach's protesting. Hey, I need that energy to digest. The skin says, no, I need it because I've hit cold water and I need to warm up. No, I need it because I'm exercising in my muscle. You see that? That's why after a meal, the best thing to do is gentle walking, dishes, just simple little things, maybe a gentle walk. But don't chop wood for about an hour and a half after you've eaten. Don't, don't do intense exercise until your stomach has gone through its major, major breakdown and it's starting to ease. But on a high carbohydrate diet, we've still got glucose left over. We've still got glucose. You see, your muscles can only store so much. Your liver can store a little bit. The glycogen in your muscle, it's like in a prison. It can only be used by the muscle. But the glycogen in your liver, that can be sent all over your body. But only so much can be stored. So now the liver stores the excess glucose in the most amazing fuel depot in the human body. Have you heard of it? It's called fat cells. And on this guy... High carbohydrate diet, what's happening to Australians, New Zealanders, Americas? What's the size of them? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh-huh. So the third place that the liver causes that glucose to be sent is as fat. It will only send it to fat if it's got leftovers from putting it through the cell and storing the glycogen. You see, high glucose demands high insulin. But there is a food that the majority of these things are made out of that's causing even more problem than refined sugar. Hippocrates has no mention of diabetes in his writings because sugar was not refined in, in Hippocrates' day. It's when sugar became refined and used more predominantly that the diabetes appeared. Because you see, when the blood sugar goes up high, which it does under the action of sugar, the brain says, overload, quick, release the insulin. And the insulin, as I showed you, gets the glucose out of the blood and into storage. But because there was so much glucose, too much insulin's released, where's the blood glucose going now? Too low. Brain says, oh no, we're too low. Stop the insulin, release the glucagon. Glucagon's the hormone that can release fat cells to get that glucose up. But what does the person usually do down there? Ah, oh, give me a cup of coffee with three teaspoons of sugar. I need a lift. How often do you hear that about 9, 9.30 in the morning in the workplace? I need a lift, I need a lift. So they have the, the Mars bar, they have the lollies, they have the biscuits, the whatever. Will that give a lift? Oh, yes. Whew. Oh no, we're too high. Stop the glucagon, release the insulin. Whew. Oh no, we're... can you see what's happening? Now the first thing that happens is that cell develops insulin resistance. Basically the cell says, I'm sick of the side of you. Have you heard of insulin resistance? 
So the insulin's released to get the glucose into the blood, but now the cell's developed insulin resistance. So the brain says, oh no, the blood sugar levels are high. Quick pancreas, more insulin, more insulin. And now the glucose starts spilling out in the urine. Do you know what diabetes mellitus means? Sweet urine. And the pancreas is just had it. It's just absolutely done. It says, I've had enough. I'm exhausted. And it's not releasing it anymore. There's, there's your diabetes. Mm -hmm. And the person starts to want to drink huge amounts of water. The huge amounts of water come in to try and balance this. Whew. But something else has come along. You see, in Australia, there are 400 diabetics diagnosed every week in Australia. Would you call an ap that an epidemic? I'd call it a pandemic. There's hardly a house without a diabetic. But something else has come along that, solves the, that, that, that has caused the problem and knowing it can solve the problem. In the 1950s, Dr. Norman Bullag and his team of scientists put wheat through intensive crossbreeding. They wanted to produce a plant with a higher yield of grain to save the starvation crisis in India, Mexico, Africa. And so they, cre they through the crossbreeding, they produced a, a plant with a higher yield. But before the grain ripened, the stalk broke. So they went back to the drawing board and they created a plant that only grows about two foot high. It has a very thick stem and it can hold the heavy yield of grain. When I was a little girl and you went out west, the wheat was this high. You go out west today, what do you see? It's way down here. I had a guest to our program, he said, my, my, my brother is in his 70s now, he's a wheat farmer, he said he loves his new wheat, he gets 10 times more grain per acre, what does that mean? 10 times more money per acre. Now no one, no one objects to the helping the starvation crisis, but what was never addressed was the effect of that grain on the human body. The hybridization of that grain produced a, a starch and it's that starch that is causing all the problems and the starch is amylopectin A. Amylopectin A is the type of starch that was produced in the hybridization. You see, you think about this. Dr. Norman Boulag got a Nobel Prize in 1969 for his hybridized wheat. 1970s, that wheat went worldwide. By the 1990s, let's have a look at this. Every cereal, bread, cake, pie, pa pizza, pasta is the hybridized wheat. No wonder we've got a problem, especially when I, you, you realize what I'm about to show you. Now that amylopectin A, that's the starch in the hybridized wheat, gets the blood sugar level up very high, very fast, and then you get this corresponding drop. Amylopectin B is found in bananas and potatoes, and if you are familiar with the glycemic index of foods, that gets it up reasonably high. So amylopectin, so this is the A, amylopectin B is basically not as high, not as fast, so not as low but it's still fairly high and fairly low. Amylopectin C is found in chickpeas, lima beans, black-eyed beans, your legumes. And amylopectin C, it gets a nice steady rise and a nice steady low. There's your C. What do our cells want? It wants the steady, consistent rise and drop. Now, let me show you where wheat sits on the glycemic index. The glycemic index is how quickly the glucose in the food is released into the blood. And this is very important for diabetics. In fact, a diabetic control, can control their blood sugar levels very well by eating all low GI foods, low glycemic index foods. So anything under 55 is considered low. Let me give you an illustration. Cherries. 
Cherries are 26. Uh, grapefruit. Grapefruit is 25. So these are good fruits for the diabetics because they're low GI or low glycemic index. Sugar, whether it be white or whether it be town or whether it be brown, is 59 and that doesn't surprise us, does it? Refined wheat. So by refined wheat, I'm referring to white bread, white pasta, white cereal, white cakes, biscuits. It's 69. Well, higher than sugar. Why? It's because of the amylopectin A the type of starch that was created in the hybridization process. Now I'm glad you're sitting down because what I'm about to show you is shocking. Wholemeal. Wholemeal wheat. 72. Ah! How could that be? Well because it's not refined it has more amylopectin A in it. Mm -hmm. I presented this one day and a lady started to cry. I said, why are you crying? She said, I was diagnosed with diabetes two years ago. She said, I'm 68 and I do everything they tell me. I have wholemeal wheat bread. I have wholemeal wheat pasta. I have wholemeal cereal. And every six months I go to the doctor and he puts me on more insulin. She said, I'm not eating bags of lollies. What's the definition of insanity, by the way? To do what you've always done and expect different results. She said, I'm crying tears of frustration because I do everything they tell me and I'm getting worse. She said, I'm crying tears of joy because you have just solved the puzzle. Now, if you want to pursue that in a little bit more detail, the book Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis. The book Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis explains that in detail. And if you get the book and want to go there quick, just look up amylopectin A in the back and you get the whole story. Aha. Uh -huh. Can you see why diabetes is out of control? So why don't the dietitians know this? Ah, uh, well, we have to go to the book Serial Killer now. In the book Serial Killer, Alan Watson, he shows that 93% of American children are having cereal for breakfast. Most of those cereals are 30% sugar. One in three American children by the age of three are obese or overweight. It is well known that these cereals store as fat. He spends a little bit of time in one of his chapters looking at the cereal industry, the grain industry. How big are they? They go to court in America defending their right to brainwash children to eat cereal. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. I was in Qantas Club. I had a five hour stopover in Sydney. So I read the Australian in detail. Don't often have time to do that. Well, look what I found. A little article on Kellogg's. Kellogg's industry. And the same thing as what Alan Watson says in his book, Serial Killer, going to court defending their right to advertise that cereals prevents obesity in children. It's a lie. <laughs> How important to understand that fat doesn't make you fat. Have you got that message yet? <laughs> In fact, on the show, Catalyst, you can eye view Catalyst last year, they did a show called Fat or Fiction. And one professor of nutrition, he said, I think it's going to take a whole generation to get out of this fat phobia that people have in their minds. And as you'll see tomorrow night, fat and cholesterol do not cause heart disease. There is actually no proof of it. 
And this just isn't my idea. I'll be giving you books and doctors that have written books to show this. Do you know who's always had a problem with saturated fat and cholesterol cause heart disease? Do you know who's always been skeptical? The heart specialists. Because they have people with low cholesterol levels having heart disease. I'm holding myself back. We'll go there tomorrow night. <laughs> fat doesn't make you fat. What makes you fat, students? It's the sugar and it's the, the wheat. The book's called Wheat Belly. He shows that this amylopectin A gets the blood sugar level up so high, so fast, the reaction by the brain is to yell at the pancreas, quick, get this stuff out of the blood. And that amylopectin A is converted into a visceral fat that sits very nicely, guess where? <laughs> it also gets dumped on the internal organs which pushes the belly out and it also dumps on the belly. In fact, in the book, nearly every page is the term wheat belly. Aha. Uh -huh. It explains so much. And tomorrow night when I look at hormones, you'll see another cause of the excess fat in this torso area is not just wheat, but also a hormonal imbalance can do it too. And with often it's a little bit of all of that. Where did the hourglass figure go? <laughs> so many people uh, uh, just think that when you, you know, they have a problem with me because, you know, ladies say, well, after I had my baby, well, I had eight. Oh, sorry, six, sorry, six. I have eight children, but my husband had two. Well, he didn't give birth to two, but you know what I mean. Well, can't, can't use that one. It's in my genes. Genetics loads the gun. Lifestyle pulls the trigger. Mm -hmm. This explains so much. There's more. For some reason, I think it's been influenced by the British that everything white is pure. And so um, bread that has the bran and the wheat germ taken out of it is a very light tan colour. So they bleach it to make it white. And the bleach is called alloxin. And research has revealed that alloxin kills the beta cells in the pancreas that make insulin. There's more. <laughs> and in his book, The China Study, Dr. Colin Campbell, he shows that, and he's got about 70 years of research under his belt, not that he's that old, but some of the research overlapped. He said the research shows that 60% of children that have cow's milk in the first year of life will develop type 1 diabetes. Wow, why is that? Well, especially when the figures reveal that about 60% of, this is in Australia, I think New Zealand's not much different, of Australians can't handle milk. You see, milk is very good for baby calves. Now, it is true that in people who have dairy in their heritage, they can handle the milk better than others. But you know the milk they, they, they're better on is the raw milk. Raw milk is very different to, to the milk you buy in the supermarket. Now, I, I'm Scottish descent and I, I can't handle milk. I never have been able to. So it's obviously dairy, uh, you know, dairy farming is not in my genes. So acknowledge that, that, that there are. My, my friend has an orphanage in Nakuru, Kenya, Africa. And she has a lot of babies come and she got some Maasai babies and she gives the babies soy milk and the Maasai babies were failing. Do you know what the Maasai's live on? Milk, meat and blood. So her husband said, we've got to get a cow. So they got the cow, milked the cow, gave it to the Maasai babies and the Maasai babies thrived. You see, it's in their genes <laughs> that they can handle the cow's milk. So I certainly acknowledge that. People say, what milk do you drink? I say, I'm weaned. I eat food. <laughs> Milks for babies. So why is the cow's milk contributing to this diabetes? 
Well, when the gut cannot handle the cow's milk, and my gut never could, in fact, I had bronchitis a lot as a child, and I realise now it was the dairy that I was having. We used to have to drink milk in school, you know, little bottles. And I tell you, I'd felt ill all morning from, from this milk. Obviously, my gut can't handle it. So it goes down into my gut. It can't be broken down properly. And so molecules are entering into my blood because it's not breaking down properly that my body doesn't recognize. Let's say this is the molecule that's broken down by, um, by the milk that wasn't, well, it couldn't be broken down properly. And so what the body does, it creates antibodies to wipe that out because it seizes as an enemy. So maybe this is the antibody that's going to wipe that out. And it does. And then it looks over and the beta cells in the pancreas have a very similar molecular structure to the breakdown of that milk that actually couldn't be broken down properly. So these antibodies come along and they start wiping out the beta cells. Ooh. That's well known and well researched. But as I said to you, there are the, that's not happening with the Maasai's. The Maasai's don't have diabetes. And by the way, the Maasai have zero heart disease, but we'll look at that tomorrow. Mind you, they don't live long. <laughs> they have other problems. So number one, how can we conquer diabetes? There are certain things that have to stop. So stop the hybridized wheat. Can you get wheat that has not been hybridized? You can. It's called ancient grains. You might have seen bread made out of ancient grains. And they are spelt. Spelt are wild hybrids of the original wheat. And also kamut. And inkhorn. So if you can find breads out of those grains, they are, the, they, they are similar to the original wheat. They don't have that amylopectin A in them. And it's the amylopectin A that was produced in the hybridization of the wheat. So stop the hybridized wheat, stop dairy, and stop the refined sugar. The refined sugar doesn't get let off the hook here. <laughs> How many... Aussies, how many New Zealanders have those three for breakfast? Mm -hmm. When I was a little girl, that's what we had for breakfast every day. Cereal, milk, sugar on top. I now know why I used to get bronchitis every winter. So those things much stop. There's something else that's contributing to the diabetes, and that is caffeine. Most people don't realize that caffeine can also get an insulin response. We had a young man do our program. His name was Dan, and he had type 1 diabetes, and he got it at the age of 15 from a very strong course of antibiotics. Drugs can sometimes kill off the beta cells in the pancreas. When he came to us, he was 20. He was carrying a little bit of extra weight. You see, insulin has a one-track one, one mind. I must store, I must store, I must store. And that's why most diabetics are carrying excess weight. It's almost impossible to lose weight when you've got high levels of insulin because it's just trying to store, store, store. He said to me, my doctor told me my, insulin, my uh, pancreas is dead. I said, is it gangrene? What's dead? Do you know if there's blood and there's lymph going through the pancreas, it's alive because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Dan heard the lectures. We don't serve any of these foods at our health retreat. He told me, he was with us for four weeks. He told me a week later, he said, I was getting blood sugar level low in the middle of the night. Why is he getting a blood sugar level low? Because he's on too much insulin. Mm -hmm. Too much insulin, he's going to bring it too low. So he'd wake up in the middle of the night and have a lolly. Now the lolly, would that get it up? Oh, yes. Boom! But he'd always get a headache. He said... 
After a couple of nights of that, I decided to try an apple. So he went and got an apple and he'd eat an apple. And the, the, sh the fruit sugars released in the apple juice, that would get it up. But it takes a long time to eat an apple in the middle of the night. He said after a couple of days of that and hearing the lecture and hearing about the glycogen stores, he would get up in the middle of the night if he had a blood sugar level low and he would do 10 push-ups. Boom, 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 boom. And it would get the blood sugar level up. Where'd that come from? His glycogen stores. He told me he got up one morning and his blood glucose levels were three. Now that's nearly passing out. Had a couple of big drinks of water. Do you know what water does? It helps to release your glycogen and your fat stores. And he went through a high intensity run up the hills, walking down the hills, running up the hills, called interval training. Came back, tested his blood sugar levels, nine. And he'd eaten nothing. He just had water. He's a very quiet young man. He said to me, why didn't anyone tell me about glycogen? Don't you think it's one of the diabetic's best kept secrets? It's already there. It's already in the muscle cell. You just do a bit of exercise and it'll be plucked. And by the way, if that runs out, what have we got? Fat. <laughs> by the third week, he'd, he'd dropped his short and long acting insulin by 90% in three weeks. And I have to tell you about um, Bobby. I run a health retreat in Alabama a couple of times a year. And last June, Bobby came and did our program. I think I've just lost my voice. Is that right? Are my batteries out? Do you want to do something? I'll speak loud. <laughs> so let me tell you about Bobby. Bobby came to us on 90 units of insulin a day. That's short and long acting. And recently they had cut his lymph glands out in his groin, thinking that that might help his diabetes. Did you hear that? I don't understand that one. I'm not a doctor, maybe I don't know my anatomy and physiology that well, but it didn't make sense to me cutting the lymph glands out in his groin. What's going to happen to his leg now? Swelled right up. Now in America, you can spend a lot of money on health. And he told me in the last 10 years, aha, we've got voice. Thank you. He told me that in the last 10 years, he'd spent a million dollars on his health. He was brought to us at 62 in a wheelchair. He could usually walk, but the flight had caused the, le caused the leg to swell right up. He was on blood pressure medication. He was on statin drugs. He was on um, blood thinning medication. Uh, he was on the short and long acting insulin. He said to me, I don't know what else to do. He said, whatever you say, I will do. I said, great. I said, let's get rid of those bandages. He had spent a fortune on these special bandages to bandage up his legs. He said, get rid of the bandage. I said, yep. And I got him on the lymphasizer, you know, the little trampoline. And I told you last night how it's one of the best things. And you know what? All you have to do is this. That's it. Or even just that. Now, as you're able, you can start jumping. What happens when you put a child near the lymphasizer? Woom, woom, woom. Open up all those lymphatic, little lymphatic channels and get the lymphatic ch moving. He said, whatever you say, I will do. His blood sugar levels were coming down, down. This is on two days of juices and it's coming down. He was exercising every day. He started to drink more water. He had a little bit of Celtic salt before each glass of water. I'll explain that and I'll tell you about it in detail tomorrow night. At the meal table, he said to me, is my plate right? And I'd look over and I'd say, mm, you've got two half potatoes, I'll take one. <laughs> potatoes are high in the glycemic index. I said, have a few more sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes give a nice steady rise, whereas potato can get it up and down. He didn't have to stop potato, but just have a little bit. 
By the time he went home, he was on a very small amount of insulin. He emailed me August. Now, when did he come to the program? June. So this is two and a half months later. He said, I am off all my medication. He said, I have lost 45 kilos in weight. Incredible story. He said, I cycle six miles a day and I swim for an hour every morning. He said, I'm doing exactly what you told me. An incredible story. An incredible story of an incredible body. Have faith in this body. You give it the right conditions, it will heal. So that must stop. Number two, what did Bobby do? He ate breakfast like a king. He ate lunch like a queen. And he ate tea like a pauper. Now, what are most diabetics told to eat? Every two hours? Lots of small meals on Friday night. You'll discover that we've only got one stomach. Cows can eat all day long because it goes from one stomach to the next stomach to the next stomach. We've only got one. And you will see a lot of stomachs don't work well because they're just overloaded. Before they've got time to finish one lot, more comes in. We gave him breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. And number three, the meals were high in fibre. What's your highest fibre food? Vegetables, no limit on the vegetables. If you have fruit, make it low GI. So he was having berries and grapefruit. I think that, that was the only fruit he was having. All your plant foods are high in fibre. Generous proteins. Plant protein is the cleanest burning fuel. So what's your plant protein? Legumes. I'm very happy to be staying with an Indian family because what do we have morning, noon? Dal. I had dal for breakfast and dal for lunch. I said to Thomas, I'm very happy with dal. <laughs> If you want to know how to cook legumes, get an Indian cookbook. Thomas said, are you looking for a cook? I said, yes, but I said, I know we can't have you. <laughs> In the back of my book, I've got recipes. You know what all the recipes are? Legumes, because most people don't know what to do. I didn't know what a lentil was till I was 20. Now I eat them every meal. Delicious. Another excellent form of protein is nuts, but don't overdo the nuts. We should have a handful every meal. Let me demonstrate the handful. Fingertips touch the palm of the hand. You'll get about eight, ten nuts. One guy said, oh, fingertip touch the palm of the hand. I think I've got it. No. <laughs> One hand. Most people don't eat that many nuts. They either eat no nuts and then They'll buy a packet of cashews and eat the whole lot in an afternoon. Do you know what the sad thing about that is? You can get an allergy to nuts eating them like that. No, just have a handful every meal. The other excellent form of protein is your seeds. Pumpkin seed, sesame seed, sunflower seed, flax seed or linseed, chia seed. Excellent form of protein. The highest form of protein in the vegetable kingdom is pumpkin seeds. 40.8 grams of protein to a cup of pumpkin seeds. Wow! I'm not suggesting you eat a cup of pumpkin seeds. We well, can if you like. And the worms hate it. That's good news. So just have a quarter of a cup. Quarter of a cup, you've got 10.2 grams of protein. Excellent form of protein. And healthy fats. What are the healthy fats? Healthy fats are fats as they come from the hand of the Creator. Your nuts and your seeds, excellent forms of fat. Avocado, coconut, and olive oil and coconut oil. The best, they're the best free oils. And they're the oils that are the most stable. They're concentrated foods, so you don't eat a lot, but it's pretty hard to drink a cup of olive oil, isn't it? 
Just put some on your food. This is what uh, Paul, the young 20-year-old, was eating, and this is what Bobby was eating. And you know what? You're not hungry. You're comfortably satisfied. You're enjoying it. Incredible results. We had a lady come with her five-year-old daughter with diabetes. On the third day, the child didn't have any insulin. <laughs> she was having a little bit. There was, you know, a little bit of time to get it stable. The mother was quite overweight. And as I was consulting with the mother, and I'd already consulted with the daughter, the little girl said, Mom, tell her. The mother looked a bit embarrassed. Tell her. And then the little girl said, she eats a bag of lollies every day. <laughs> Do you know, is that bag of lollies every day overworked the pancreas to the point that she gave a compromised pancreatic gene to her daughter? Yeah. Mm. Now, there's a beautiful verse in the Bible. There are many beautiful verses. But in Acts 17, verse 30, the Bible says that God winks at our ignorance, so should we. So that lady is not to beat herself up. She didn't know. <laughs> but you know what? When anyone came to Jesus and he said, I forgive, go and what did he say? Sin no more. <laughs> I forgive, I understand, you didn't know, but don't eat them anymore. <laughs> and the amount of people that have come to me and said, since I'm eating like this, I don't have sugar cravings. Sugar is highly addictive, wheat is highly addictive. The more you eat it, guess what? The more you will crave it. This morning I had dal for breakfast, I had some blueberries, and I had a little bit of roti, you know, the... Um, Indian chapati type bread. And I didn't have any hunger pangs until about one. And I ate at eight. And at lunch I had a big salad. I had avocado and tomato and olive oil on that and lettuce from the garden. And we had macadamia nuts and walnuts in it. You see that? All fiber, lots of fiber, generous proteins and fats. And then I had Chickpea, no, not chickpea, um, black-eyed bee dal. And I went and had seconds. Now that was at 1.30. I still have no hunger. I had breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen. Now after prancing around on the stage and using a lot of energy, I might be hungry on the way home. So you know what I'll do? I'll eat a banana. If I was a diabetic, I'd eat a little hand of blueberries. <laughs> That's it. But if I don't lecture at night, often I don't have anything at night. So what could be tea like a pauper? Well, sometimes paupers don't eat, you know that. Tea like a pauper could be a bowl of soup. It could be a vegetable juice, something very light. One lady said, I have a light tea. I just have a slice of toast. That's not light. <laughs> toast is not light. It's not light. Maybe a, a plate of salad. Our exercise coordinator, Howard, think that he's about 38 and he's 54. You'll see a picture on him on the brochure. He's very fit. Well, he has something at night because this guy is a bundle of energy and he's going all day long. So, so the tea, it depends on the, your physical and mental output through the day. If you're hungry, have something, but make it light. Make it light. It is these three food groups, fibre, protein and fat that keep the food in the stomach longer. So you can go the distance between meals. And remember, even when your stomach's empty, you've got your glycogen stores and you've got your fat stores. We have phenomenal results within days. Diabetics implementing this. But there's more. Number four, water. Our body loss, even on cold weather like this today, is about two and a half litres. We need to replace the two litres. The other half litre can be replaced by fruits, vegetables, herb teas. The best way to take it is little by little by little. Start early. Have it by your bed. As soon as you wake up, have a glass of water. 
After you've got dressed and been to the bathroom, have another glass of water. After you've done your high intensity exercise, come back and maybe have some hot water with a bit of lemon. What's that? That's three quarters of a litre, more than a quarter of your daily intake, even before eight o'clock. That's how to do it, start early. <laughs> have it by your bed, if you wake in the night, have a glass. So approximately two litres over the day and whole salt. That's your Celtic salt or your Himalayan salt. They both have 82 minerals in them. And as you'll see tomorrow night, I will illustrate on the board, the magnesium in those salts pulls the water inside the cell. In the book, The Calcium Lie, Dr. Robert Thompson, he says, a crystal of Celtic salt on your tongue before every glass of water will only replace the minerals you lost yesterday. One lady said, surely not every glass. Yes. Yes. And it gets the water inside the cell. One lady said, I don't drink a lot of water because I'm running to the little house all day. I said, try this and try sipping the water. Mouthful here, mouthful there, mouthful here. Little by little over the day. And before you start every glass, every um, 250 ml glass, have a little crystal of Celtic salt. She came to back to me. She said, I'm not running to the bathroom all day. You see, 500 mil in, not long to go before 500 mil has to come out. Do it little by little by little. It's great news for people who are a little elderly. Often elderly people don't drink water because they think they may not make the toilet. Have the salt and just sip it all through the day. You know, when we had that heat in, in Australia not long ago, a lot of old people die. Why did they die? dehydrated. You see, one cup of coffee requires five glasses of water to account for the dehydrating agents in one cup of coffee. So sorry, that don't work. <laughs> Number five is exercise. And the best exercise is the high intensity interval training. The high intensity interval training, as the name implies, are intervals of high intensity and intervals of recovery. So the high intensity should be approximately, well, depending on what you can do, but between 20 and 30 seconds of high intensity. Well, that's not very long, is it? Try it. When I get to 20 seconds of running as hard and as fast as I can go, my body says, stop, please. But I push on. At 25 seconds, my body says, this is ridiculous. At 30 seconds, I feel like I'm dying. And you know, it's a principle in nature. It's a spiritual principle that life comes from death. Is that right? When you feel like you're dying, you're actually really living. And remember what I said, 3,600 mils, you're breathing in 3,600 mil out. It's powerful. Powerful blast of oxygen. But something else is happening. Your cells are starting to move. Now this 20-step pathway is fast. This 8-step pathway is slow. And when you start moving, both those pathways speed up. No wonder. But because this is such a fast pathway and this one's slower, the speed of this pathway is so fast that more pyruvate is being made than can be fed into the powerhouse. And so now the body stores it here as lactic acid. You've heard of lactic acid? In recovery time, how long's recovery time? Recovery time might be uh, two minutes, maybe three or four minutes. In fact, I was running with Jeremy, and after one minute he said, can we go again? I said, no. <laughs> he had his breath back. I didn't. <laughs> when you get your breath back, when you feel you can do it again, maybe one or two or three minutes. In recovery time, what's recovery time? Recovery time might be just, just standing there, leaning against a tree or a post, or if you're very fit, it might be just... <laughs> 
little runs. If you're cycling, it might be cycling downhill. In recovery time, the liver converts that lactic acid back to pyruvate and feeds it into the powerhouse. Wow. If you didn't have recovery time, students, what would happen to the lactic acid? Building up. So it's not an excuse when you have a stop that you can't go any further. It's very important. <laughs> I always say, I'm just looking at the view. <laughs> what happens to the person that does a 5K jog? What happens to their lactic acid? It's building up and up and up. That's why the research shows that this is the most effective form of exercise, interval training. And it can be done for a cycle of three to six. I think we did a cycle of about four this morning. That doesn't take very long. What's the maths on that? 12 minutes? 12 minutes in a 24 hour period day, that's not much. That is far more effective than a 5k jog. Mm -hmm. What's high intensity? High intensity can be running for your life. Can't run? Exercise bike. Can't exercise bike? Swim. Can't swim. I'm sure your water's a bit cool here. Well, what about the lymphasizer? Have you tried the lymphasizer? Just jigging? You start with just jigging and then you start jumping and then you can start running and with the running you do knee and like this and start jumping from side to side fantastic high intensity but I'm a bit wobbly on my feet well buy a lymphasizer or a rebounder that's got a bar and you can hold on to the bar and do it there now what that high intensity does it increases blood supply to the pancreas and it wakes it up Remember, the life of the flesh is in the blood. When more blood is coming to the pancreas, it's actually feeding the beta cells in the pancreas, waking them up, but there's more. That high-intensity exercise increases the insulin receptor sites on the cell. So if someone has insulin resistance and they start drinking more water, stop all that, start eating like this, they can turn insulin resistance around in a couple of days. That's exciting, isn't it? Your fitness is not indicated by how hard and fast you can go, but how long you take to recover. And if your recovery time's 10 minutes, and some people who are very unfit it is, that's all right, because it won't always be 10 minutes. It'll change. So the exercise is vital. There is a formula, and if you abide by the formula, you will get the results. And the remarkable stories that I've told you tonight are illustrations of the result of implementing these simple things. And I look at all that and I can't see any expensive supplements. Can you? No. It's, I think God meant it to be simple. People say, what about this supplement? What about this supplement? I said, don't worry about that. Just do this. Just do this. It takes energy and it takes effort but you will receive more than you expend when you do this. It's the best insurance policy that you can make. Is these simple lifestyle habits. So the challenge is, try it. I'm gonna try to finish my lecture so you're at, you're at home on time because it's between the hours of, two, of 9 p.m and 2 a.m. that your batteries recharge. So that's the sixth and the final point in diabetes is sleep. So they're the hours that your beta cells are going to be recharged. And they're the hours that your body will be able to do it 
if you implement all of this. Thank you for your attention. It's seven o'clock and we're going to come back at half past seven and I'm going to show you how you can empower your immune system. So all through the coming winter when people are falling all around you with colds and even coughing all over you, you won't. That sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs>